We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run. Always chasing, never stop. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. How are you, Ben? Doing excellent, Patrick. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. We are returning to our two-minute drill. We actually haven't done this in a little bit. I'm excited to get back at it. Uh, two-minute drill is when I go through my Instagram DMs and collect uh, all the great questions that listeners send us that they would love to hear your take on, our take on occasionally. The challenge to you is these are questions that uh, do not often fit nicely into into two minutes, but that is your challenge. That's why we call it a two-minute drill. So for folks who want to get a question into the queue, just find me on Instagram, P.S. Cummings, uh, and just drop me a DM, and I will add it to our list. Ready to go? Rock and roll. All right. First question. What strategies do you recommend when and if things go sideways while focusing on the five factors? For instance, how, how to deal with something like a breakup or a divorce? Okay. So the five factors are how you train, how you eat, how you sleep, how you connect both with nature and other people and how you think. So as things, when things are smooth sailing, it's nice and easy, but that's not what kind of dictates who we become in our lives is how do we deal with the setbacks. And it's really important. So here's the thing is as you deal with something, a, um, a breakup, a divorce, something like that, what you want to do is you want to self-soothe for the short term. So you grab mm -hmm. the bowl of ice cream and you chill in front of Netflix because it feels so good in that moment. But that just creates further the downward cycle. And I've learned this, you know, being married to Heather so much, like Heather's so good at when things are um, not the way that they should be of doubling down and being extra good. And that's so hard because it requires so much discipline. Yeah. Everything from a hormonal perspective is tugging you in the other way. So the first part is recognize that it's not easy, but you going for the haagen you going for the fast food, you going to be a sloth on the couch is not in the going to make you feel better in the long term. It does for those minutes. So the first part is that awareness. And the second part is, that kind of competitor mindset is what better time to actually lean into this stuff. So when things are going well, particularly the, the mental piece of it, how you think when things are going well, it's really easy to, um, have, you know, the, the right thoughts going through our head, but we have to recognize that there's going to be troubles. There's going to be challenges. And these are the opportunities to do just that. So mm. the first step is the awareness. Um, but awareness needs to there after awareness, then you have to have intentionality. Like you have to really like put your foot forward and then you have to take the massive action to make it happen. So it's kind of that triage of things or that trilogy of things. Um, as you're going through this, be aware that you're going through it, be aware that it's going to be hard, be intentional with it. Say, I'm going, this is what I'm going to do. And then actually fall through on it. Easier said than done. Yeah. Um, I love just out of curiosity, I, because this, this person did mention a, a breakup and a divorce, I'm guessing that that's not, not just a random, mm -hmm. <laughs> a random example of when things get hard. If you obviously not knowing any of the context, but looking at the five factors or thinking about the five factors, is there one for a for a person in that position that you would think that you would advise them to lean into even more? You know, given everything you just said, but is there one in there that's like you know in this particular time? context and challenge, like here's what I would suggest you, you overemphasize or over index towards. Yeah. It's a great question, Patrick. I would overemphasize the one that is the easiest for you. Mm. So if you love, if going to the gym is easy for you, like go to the gym and spend an extra half hour, an extra hour at the gym. If, um, cooking really healthy meals is something you find a lot of fulfillment with, like dive into that one. If you walking through nature and connecting with um, um, uh, watching sunsets is something that is like really inspires you and makes you feel at peace with the world. Go do that one. So you're already up against enough of it yeah. from the, 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 um, the way your chemicals are working inside of your body. Don't try to make it harder by trying to lean into one that you have. This is not the time to work on your weaknesses. This is the time to double down on the strengths. 
Yeah, that's great. I love that. Okay, next question. Once a week, I do a double session with two training sessions back to back with about 30 minutes in between to recover. What should I be What should I be doing in that 30 minutes to maximize my recovery for the next session? Okay. Uh, I hate that this depends a lot, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it depends on what that first session is. Depends on what the second session is. Uh, uh, depends on how old you are. Depends on uh, the intensity levels. Oh, so... Man, some big overarching themes are um, hydrate, electrolytes, and carbs. Kind of like without a, you know, those are things that seem to be the biggest ones. If you're doing a strength training session, maybe not be as important, but anything that's going to burn up glycogen or carbohydrates, um, those are the big ones. Hydration means just liquids. Um, carbohydrates, pretty straightforward. I think that powdered mixes work the best there, but whatever, you know, banana. Um, fuel for fire, something like that. And then electrolytes, um, electrolytes being salt, magnesium, potassium, calcium, that sort of stuff, but sodium being the by far and the biggest one. An easy thing is have a shake with those things in it. Um, and then from there depends on what it is, but it, it's almost like what you want to do is not come all the way down mm. in 30 minutes. This person saying they're doing double sessions. That's not a double session at all. Yeah. That's a single session. You're taking a break. Yeah. Um, a double session means that you start one session. You could have six pieces in one session, but then you stop, take a big break. You cool all the way down. You eat real food. Then you have to warm all the way back up. In this 30-minute session, I would not allow your body to come back down. I would keep your heart rate up. I would stay warm. I would stay loose. Um, it's not a matter of like jumping into norm attacks or anything yeah. like that. Um I would actually stay, um, keep the heart rate going. You're in a much easier time than trying to cool it down and then bring it back up. Don't, um, don't park the car in the garage overnight in a cool environment. Just keep the thing running a little bit, idling, ready to go. Yeah. Well, that's a great point that that's not a double session. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Next question. I work in a small company and a member of the upper management is the poster child for toxic bosses. Nothing is ever good enough for our standards and the standards change every day. No matter what anybody does, how much time and energy goes into it, he finds flaw with the work. He micromanages everything we do and then complains that we are not proactive, even though uh, all our attempts to be are shut down. We're highly qualified employees made to feel like garbage besides getting the hell out, which mm -hmm. I'm working on. What is the, uh, uh, what is the best way to deal with a workplace that makes you feel like you can't do anything right? I'm at a point now where this is starting to seriously affect my physical and mental health. If I could just quit, I would, but I am the main money earner for the family. Okay. Lots of sympathy um, yeah. because your work environment is so massively important. It's where people spend the majority of their lives, you know, conscious lives. Um, hopefully that's not the case. And people are conscious when they're um, with their families and, um, doing and doing their hobbies and things that truly fulfill them, but, um, sympathy and respect because working your way out and you're not just, you're taking ownership of it. Understand that it might take a little bit because you're the, the breadwinner and need to support the family. Okay. Dot, dot, dot. Um, really simple. The first one is, um, this is not the owner of the business. This is not the CEO. This is a part of upper management. So what you need to do is you need to go to his bosses and present this issue to them. It's a hard thing. It's a scary thing, but you're on your way out anyway. It's toxic as it is. You're not going to make it worse. They are probably going to be incredibly grateful. It's probably something that they've been trying to figure out as anyway. They might just need you, somebody else to be like, hey, this actually really is an issue. This is something that's toxic for a company. He is really undermining... It's going to be so valuable for the true upper management or his peers or his boss or the true owner or CEO, whoever it is, to get the insights from you, somebody that is the true producer, you know, the foot soldier with their feet on the ground actually doing the work. So I almost feel like you have a responsibility, not I almost feel like you have a responsibility to bring this to the decision makers in the company and let them know how toxic this one person is to the rest of the team. Is it one of those cases we've talked about before where you want to go in with a solution oriented mindset or is it a, is it as simple as like, I just want to make sure you guys know that this is, this is what's happening. 
Love it, Patrick. Okay. So that's another question. So I get two more minutes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so here's my suggestion on how to approach that situation is you don't go in accusatory. You don't go in lo looking like you're just trying to blow off steam or a bitch session or gossip or anything. The right. You go in there with this idea that you have the company's best interest at heart and you go in with a, and you ask them a question, which is simply, um, this is something I'm feeling. It's something that I'm struggling with. And I'd love to get your insight on what you think the best way is for me to deal with this situation. Mm -hmm. And you present it out. Um, um, employee X is um, all these things. We're trying to be proactive. We're trying to do the right things. Everything we do is being shot down. And then, as you just said, Patrick, go in with possible, do you think I should talk to them? Do you think I should just sit back and take this? Do you think, um, what do you, what would you do if you were in my shoes? What do you think we should do? Like, just kind of like throw that out there and put them as a decision maker, empower them, um, never split the difference type stuff. Ask them the question. Don't go with it. This is what I think we should do. Not that type of solution oriented mindset. The solution oriented mindset, like together, I love to know what you think we should do about this situation. If anything, if you don't think we should do anything, get it. But now you know that they're not going to do anything and you really try to work your way out of the company. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that, and I'm sure you've been in this position too. I, I have, uh, it's been a while, but been in a position where, you know, I was managing people and somebody wasn't happy and it wasn't brought to my attention until that person came to me and said, you know, I, I've got to leave. This isn't working mm -hmm. for me because at that point, as the person who could have done something about it, I'm yeah. powerless. I can't fix it now. Whereas if that person had come to me six months ago and said, Hey, listen, this isn't feeling good. This isn't right. Can I talk to you about it? At least, I don't know if I could have fixed it, but at least I had a chance at fixing it. And I'm sure you've been in a position where somebody's like, ah, this isn't working. And you're like, I wish I knew that a year ago or six months ago or three months ago. I wish I knew your manager was making your life difficult because I probably could have at least gone and done something to help that. And so I just, I'm just kind of reinforcing what you said. Like it, if they're smart, if they're good, they're going to recognize that this is an opportunity not to lose valuable mm -hmm. people. Absolutely. Yeah. Next one. My partner is having a hard time at work and I want to help her. She's constantly telling me about the hard time she's having. And I try to remind her that she should not complain and highlight the, the negative part of things. How can I make her aware of this without giving her the impression of not wanting to listen to her when she tells me about it? I wonder if this is the husband of the previous question. <laughs> answer. <laughs> uh, okay. So the first part is... Um, it, it takes a certain level of awareness or emotional intelligence or people smarts or um, feelers to understand what, what, what does the person truly need? Yeah. Do they need just somebody to listen to? Cause once they vent it, they feel better. And that's really, that's going to help them so much. And that's not, this is kind of like the guy versus girl thing. Like, Girls want to get things off their chest. They want to voice things. They just want to be heard. They just want to like um, people to rally around. I, I feel that. You know, I feel it. I understand. I understand where you're coming from. That is so hard. Where guys want to truly fix things and they want to um, come come up with solutions. And um, you can, if you try to fix it, you can actually further it because I, I don't. Want you, I just want to like let's just. So that's the first part is understanding where the person's coming from, and where do they truly want and need. So if you go, if, um, if you, and, and honestly, truly what nobody needs is for you to point out how they're complaining. Yeah. <laughs> so we have this like never whine, never complain, never make excuses principle. But when people are in the midst of it, that's not the time to call them out on it. That is the time where you need, they need the empathy. You need to crawl into the well with them be like, whoa, it is really dark. It is really scary. It is really cold down here. It is really wet. Whoa. Um, together, let's see if we can climb our way out of this thing. Feeling what they're feeling every step along the way. So I don't have the specific because I don't know the sp specifics of it. Um, but to me, it is true. It, it's, it's most important in that situation is to um, try to really see it from where they want you to be. Um, and not call them out for complaining at that moment. And if you can, um, if they can feel like they, you are that empathetic listener, that builds trust. And once you build that trust, it's kind of like what you need first. Like, um, 
you know, trust is consistency plus care plus, um, um, expertise or whatever it is, uh, mm -hmm. competency, it's this three C's. So the first thing you need to do is show that you care. Like you can't show the expertise. You can't show the competency. You can't, well, here's the solution. Here's what you do in this case, you know, and you can't, you have to first show that you care about them. And if you do that, then the level of trust goes up and up and up to the point where then you can give some suggestions. So, um, I would, you know, if this was the case and, um, Heather was having a really hard time, the first thing I would want to do is just, um, you know, hug her, you know, and be like that. It, that's hard. I get it. Like, um, that is hard and maybe nothing else until the next time she comes and you again, give her and like, she knows that you're a safe place that she can come to bring problems to. Cause if right now you're instead going like, well, don't complain. Look at the bright side. Look what you got. You got all these things. Like mm -hmm. you're not a person she can find in. That's not the trust. So I would start there. Would you, would you say it's the same advice? Uh, cause I, I think it gets really complicated fast when it's a significant other. And that can be for lots of different reasons. But would you say it's the same basic advice? Like if one of your kids came to you with the same, same complete, you know, same context, same situation, same, would you, would you look at it the same way? Or do you feel like as the, as the role, as the position of dad there, you would lean, you would lean more into the talking about complaining, talking about mindset and all that stuff, or is it still empathy, still listening, still patience? Yeah. So you can still have, you can still talk about the complaining. You can still talk about the solution. You still that with regardless of who it is. Um, and the speed at which you get there is the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do in the beginning is if your kid comes up to you and goes, um, you know, little Johnny said to me this to me about on the bus. And it's so unfair that he's, you know, this jerk. And I was, if you go, if you, it, the, I think the really important is to show that you care about your, your child first. Mm -hmm. before you go, um, about how to deal with Johnny. So it's, it depends on how much trust is built. So it's not what everyone does though is go, because they're my kids and because I'm the role model, I have to set the standard and I have to be the one that lays down the law I have to teach the lessons. And, um, basically what they're saying is I don't have time for the caring mm -hmm. and, or, and, or no, they know I care about them. They know I love them. They know all this. Well, they're at the most, they're most vulnerable. And when they're at the most vulnerable, when they, that's when they need, they don't need the lectures. They need the, I love you. I care about you. And I'm not saying bypass the other side, but, but you can't overlook that piece because it will fall on deaf ears. Actually it's worse. It creates a greater divide. They came to you looking for this connection and you're driving a, a, the, a stake to make the gap bigger. And again, it's, it's hard, but it takes a level of patience, but this is what leaders and this is what relations are built upon. The saying is you can't, um, you can't be, uh, efficient with people. So you can't get there quickly. It's not a time thing. You cannot be efficient with people. You can only be effective mm -hmm. and effect effectiveness can take long time and lots of effort. So recognize that it's not the quick fix. And I think that's what parents try to do. They have a million gazillion things going on. Kids coming with a problem or kid did something bad. Kid still hasn't gone to brush their teeth. And like, would you please just go upstairs and brush your, it's like, that's not helping anything. And again, like I, I'm, 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 I'm saying it's because I struggle with these things as well. Right. And yeah. I have the same issues. So I understand my shortcomings. I'm bringing those to the table. Next question. I'm an Alpine ski coach working with yes. 12 to 17 year olds, uh, 12 to 17 year old athletes. It's a very technical sport. And we do, uh, we do give a lot of feedback on lots of different skills that play a part in the big picture of building great overall skiers. I'd love to hear the who, what, why, where, how of giving feedback to athletes, maybe how you categorize types of feedback and thoughts on when too much technical feedback is detrimental in a highly technical sport or while learning highly technical skills like a muscle up or snatch. I feel like this concept fits well under the umbrella of coaching as an art and a science. Okay. In two minutes, I'm going to give this uh, two pieces of this. Um, the who, what, where, why, all that comes down to two different things. Is it truly a technical skill or is it a quote unquote soft skill? Mm -hmm. So if it's a technical skill in ski racing, they're not getting on their edge. They're looking um, at their ski tips instead of down the race course. They're not sitting for the next turn. They're not balanced correctly. You give that feedback in as real time as possible. They're not getting the starting gate fast enough. They're not finishing strong, whatever it might be, as quickly as they can. That's part of deep practice is immediate and constant feedback. 
if it's a quote, I hate this term, but soft skill, mm-hmm. like their overall competitiveness, a mindset thing, their nervousness, their anxiousness, you don't want to do that as quickly as possible. You need to create a resume to be able to go back and talk to the person about that. Because if it can look like you're jumping down someone's throat, they do one run and they came out of the starting gate lazy. And you're like, you need more. You're la- you're lazy. You're like a lazy, you, or they're late to the starting gate. Like you don't spend enough time preparing. You're like, that's just too much. It's a personal attack. But if you go, hey, over the last seven practices, you know, I've seen you come to the starting gate late six different times. Like, I think that we could do a little bit more in terms of your preparation, your attention to detail. So that's the first one. Hard or soft skills, um, hard skills in the moment, soft skills, build a repertoire. The next one is in all these technical skills where you want to give all this different stuff and who, what, where, why, when, it comes down to one thing and effective coaches simplify, period. What you need to do is talk to the athlete in not a technical overloaded way. It's your job to figure out what is the simplest way I can present this to have the most effective um, changes in my athlete. So for example, Cole Sager is here this week visiting us. We're working on his snatch. Mm -hmm. He wants to, man, we did so much video review. We spent so much time working on this lift and he wanted to talk about so many different things. And it's a very technical lift and he has probably 10 to 15 things he needs to work on in the lift. But we broke it down to where it's, I, I want you to focus on one thing. And one thing only, because truthfully, it's all you can change. And that was, he needs to keep the bar closer to his body, which the cue is, I need you to sneak the bar under your shirt. Mm. Purposely had him wear a flowy shirt so we could see the bar being lifted up as he lifted. Simple, like that's like, there's a lot of things. And he's like, okay, but how do I get to this position? And what about my, um, my, ankle flexion? And what about the lean back? And what about my shrug? And what about my wrist through the middle? It's, those are all things that are, they're all things of concern, but let's Mm -hmm. just focus on one thing and one thing. Keep the bar close, sneak it under your shirt and just keep, because if that, just keep making it as simple and as simple and simple as possible. It's not well, what we need to do is recruit the posterior chain by getting your chest over, uh, by uh, being more patient and waiting chest over the bar in the second pole to allow the bar to come in through the scoop. And then we can find your power position to be able to drive through the middle, extending through flat through through the floor to get as much vertical displacement, not horizontal. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, those are all the things. <laughs> yeah. Those are all the things. Yep. But we can, we can really simplify that and go, try to get the bar to go underneath your shirt. Yep. That's li- just get the bar under your shirt. So you as a ski coach, what is that one real word that you would have a conversation with a kindergartner that they would understand what you mean by that? Simplify. Next question. How would you recommend dealing with cancellations to a class? Uh, This is in the gym context. We require members to RSVP. Oftentimes class is full, which doesn't allow other members to train in a given class. But when the time comes, one or two members, no show. It's frustrating because it affects other members. We have we have been recommended to charge late fees, but that doesn't feel right. How should we address this? This is a cool question. And there's a lot of cool little things in there. Um, The first one is, um, they don't have a problem really of getting members into class. They have problem like too many people. So that's why they have sign up. And it's, so it's just, and then I love the idea of we've been recommended to charge late fees, but that doesn't, or cancellation, but that doesn't yeah. seem right. I love that. Um, and the honest answer to this is I don't have a good answer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something that we're working through right now as well. Um, so maybe we can do a longer, um, big, I just want to give a, uh, an answer that I'm going to, um, you know, in six weeks have a different answer to. Mm-hmm. So maybe this is once we work through this and we cur- honestly, we just had a meeting about this. So maybe we have a, um, another bigger question about this later on down the road. Um, because the question basically is, um, what's the best membership system in yeah. CrossFit? That's honestly what the question is. And, um, we've been around for, uh, next year's our 15 year anniversary, which is bonkers. Awesome. Yeah, um, 
and we're still working on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, so it's such a good question. It's an amazing question. I get it. Every you feel it's different. So why don't you just tell me what you're doing? It's not, um, but because we're changing so much right now, I would love to have a, a real conversation about, you know, overall membership retention. Cause I think this falls into membership retention. Yeah. Of that. Cool. We'll definitely do that. All right. Next question. Do you have a particular training program that you would recommend leading up to a Spartan beast? Did yes, you do I a Spartan did. beast? I did. Uh, I did a beast, but there's also the ultra beast. Ultra beast. Right. We did a whole episode about you training for it. So I'll link that in the, in the show notes, but, but go cool. ahead. Um, so yes, I do. I would, um, follow the comp train. So if you go into the comp train app, there's basically, you have three different choices. Do you want to train for the sport of CrossFit? Do you want to train for a strength and power sport? Or do you want to train for an endurance sport? I would choose doing, choose the endurance sport track. Essentially what you do is you'll do Metcons. You'll get stronger. You'll be able to flip the tires. You'll be able to do the pull-ups. You'll be able to handle the obstacles. You'll be able to do the burpees, but there's so much it's endurance focused. So you can get, which is what these events are. You'll get so much more um, of that. And then because it's not a obstacle course track, it's an endurance track. I would just do some of those running sessions um, in the mountains. You know, most of these events are in mountains um, and I would just do some of the longer or once a week, uh, you know, the weekends go and do uh, 90 minutes up and down hills. And that's honestly, I think if you do the, that, the comp train endurance focused track and once a week get a 90 minutes to two hours up and down hills, um, you will crush it. Mm, I love that. And it's kind of an, an embarrassing admission, but 10 years ago I ran a, uh, this wasn't it, but it was like a 20 mile race uh, through the woods. And I, it was, I just, I just did CrossFit. I was like, I can just do CrossFit and do some like longer 5Ks and stuff. But I never ran in the woods. I never ran up a hill outside of Boston. And then I showed up for a 20 mile race through the woods. And I was just like, nope, not prepared for that. <laughs> not prepared uh -huh. just for the terrain. It's like yeah. anything, everything else is fine. But the terrain itself just, I just wasn't prepared for it because I wasn't smart enough to realize like, oh, you actually have to get out into the woods if you plan on running in the woods. Yep. Here's the, I, I will add this. If you want to like, if you want to go in like, can, uh, uh, do it, finish it, do well. That is, is enough. If you're talking about like, I want to qualify for world championships, like anything, you got to train sports specific. So I think that the comp train endurance is a good base, but then you have to do the specific thing. You have to really practice monkey bars. You have to really mm -hmm. practice um, carrying a, a bucket loaded with stone up a hill. You have to really practice um, swinging from ropes. You have to really practice chucking a spear. You have to really practice um, – climbing up mountain, up and down mountains for six hours at a time. Like it's, um, but as a general thing, I think that the, uh, endurance track would completely set you up for success. Love it. All right. Next question. A little bit of a longer one. I'm a 30 year old military guy with probably the training age of 40 due to the years of running city miles. We have a unit fitness standard that involves treading water for two minutes into swimming 500 meters, rocking 5k with 35 uh, kilos for time, then straight into max deadlifts at 165 pounds. Uh, that's followed by a different day fitness test with mostly shuttles, burpees, sandbag lifts, and weighted drags. I look around the unit and see all manner of fitness ideology, CrossFit triathletes, power lifters, some mix of the, uh, some mix of all of them. Some of the older guys around the gym, uh, some of the older guys around the gym with too many running miles have knee problems. Some heavy lifter, lifters have knee, shoulder, back, and hip issues. Surgeries are, are common anyone uh, for anybody over 35. My question is, how would you approach these annual fitness standards in, in a programming sense with the mindset of wanting to excel, but also realizing that longevity is the goal? Okay. First off, that is a burly test. Mm. Oh my God. That's a re so this has got to be a special forces guy because that's yeah, that's not regular that, PT yeah. stuff. But yeah. I'm just gonna say it again. You tread water for two minutes, then you swim 500 meters, which is if you're cooking is seven seven and a half minutes. Then you um, run a 5k with 80 pounds on your back, and then you do max deadlifts at unbroken at 165 pounds. Yep. And that's just one. And, and, the next, he, and he had and, mentioned that 40 reps is a good score of the. And then the day test. two, you do shuttle runs and burpees. And oh my God, that's amazing. I love <laughs> that. Okay. Um, so here's the way I would do this is for nine months of the year. So if you, assuming you know when this comes up, yep. nine months of the year, you're going to follow. It's the same as the last one. You're mm -hmm. going to follow the 
comp train endurance track. It's super well balanced. It's not going to beat you up because it has a lot of aerobic work, but it has on rowing and bikes and also running. Um, but you're also going to go and swim, um, tread water and swim um, once or twice a week, depending on how proficient you are to, as a swimmer. So if you are really uncomfortable, if you have a um, eight and a half minute, 500, you should swim probably two or three times a week. If you have under a seven minute, um, you should probably only swim once a week. If you have a, a you know, a five or six, um, you don't need to swim at all. Um, <laughs> and then I would hold off on all the rucking and all the rest and all the sports specific stuff, like the deadlifts, like the shuttles, like the burpees until the three months before. Hmm. And that three months before you are going to go to event specific prep and you're going to do a lot of this work. You're going to do a lot of this stuff, um, where you will actually use the, you just pair, pair, um, pull apart the tests and do those things individually. Then like you would in um, a triathlon, you do them as bricks. So you stack one, then what's the next thing? So you do tread water into swim. Mm -hmm. And next time you do swim into ruck. And the next time you do ruck into deadlift and so on. And then you do three things together. And then you find out um, what is the thing that you should really focus on this one thing. Is the deadlift, is it your max strength that's holding your back or your um, posterior endurance, or is it your grip stamina and you train that thing? So you root the, the weakest link of any of those things. And then you lean to that become, that becomes the accessory work that builds around all of that stuff. So say it again, nine months of comp train endurance based training with extra swimming built in, then three months leading up to it, you work on the actual event stuff, um, pair adding in additional accessory work based off of whatever you root as the, uh, the root cause of any weaknesses that you have along the way. Love it. Next one. I am trying to stay on a low carb diet for my current fitness goals. How should I work around a situation at home where my wife cooks fried food or pasta often for our daughter, which is really tempting for me to stick to my nutrition plan night after night with all this extra food at the dinner table. All right, I'll give you the most impactful, but the hardest, yep. um, have the conversation with your wife. She's um, not doing good things to your daughter. That's that's the honest answer. Like you won't eat it, but you'll give it to your daughter. I'm not gonna have the cigarettes, but I'll give them to my daughter. Like, dude, like have that hard conversation with your wife. And I get it, that's hard, but this is not you about like trying to build abs. This is about health. This is about longevity. This is about building up your immune system. This is about um, you know, be able to thrive in life and you should want that for your daughter as much as you want it for you. The quicker, easier one, I shouldn't say easier, the, the, the easier one, the quicker one that doesn't involve having a hard conversation with your wife is discipline, bro. Yeah. Like discipline is doing the things you don't want to do like you love doing them. That's a Mike Tyson quote. Mm. So doing the things you don't want to do in a way that would be like you loved doing them. That's what – and yeah, if fried chicken is being served in front of you every night. It's going to make it way, way harder. It's going to take way, way more discipline for sure. But to me, I see that as the two options. You either clean up the environment by talking to your wife or you just got to buckle up and do, you do more work yourself. Next question. At 53 years old, I'm starting to see declines in various fitness markers, uh, slower named workouts, slower running paces, lower max lifts, et cetera. Do you have anything you can share that we can do to slow the decay? I eat well, no processed foods, low sugar, no gluten, minimal dairy, um, lots of fresh vegetables, fruit, lean meats, and nuts. I sleep consistently and do about 30 minutes a day of mobility work. Is there anything else we can do to move the needle? And finally, how do you coach or how would you coach us around the mental psychological part of dealing with the decline in performance? Okay, dude, you're killing it, right? Like you're killing. It. So um, and it's a really cool question. So because what he said was, um, or she said, um, was I'm training, I'm doing mobility, I'm eating, I'm sleeping, right? So he listed mm -hmm. three of the five factors. And he seems super dialed with those three, but he said, what else would you do? The obvious answer is the other two. So there's, there's room to have there. And he, he, he asked about the other, one of the other ones, which is so cool. He knew what he was missing. 
He's like, what would you do in terms of training the mindset about this? So you're exactly right. The thing that you can do to further slow the decline is work on your mindset. 100%. That's exactly what you do. The next thing is work on your connection, connection with nature, connection with other people. Those things affect the quote unquote, your quote, the speed at which you decline or whatever the way he said that. So that's what I would do. But here's the mindset piece of it to start is, you know, don't be the, this is where optimists get crushed. He's like, I, like, I don't like, it's okay. Mm. I'm not going to slow down. I'm going to be as fit when I'm 80 as I am when I'm 40. No, you are not. The <laughs> decline is going to happen. You got to be a realist. It is part of being a human being. It's a part of being any living thing on planet earth is that there is a life cycle. There is a birth, there is a growth, there is a decay, unfortunately, and then there is a death. And what's going to happen to us, you have to understand this is part of the process is that this is going to happen. So when it happens, you don't get all bent out of shape. And what you're trying to do is exactly what this guy's doing in a, is you try to slow it. That's what we're trying to do. Because if you're this guy, I can, this guy or girl, I can just tell is pre I bet that they're actually like a CrossFit games, masters type athlete. Mm, yep. Um, that if you have this capacity, this health, this vitality at 92 that you do right now at 53, dude, like you, you're, they're going to be writing, they're going to be making movies about you. <laughs> so that's, so it's not about, you just got to kind of, you're right to try to slow it all down, but understand it's a part of the deal. It's going to happen. And then work on the other two factors. Two more questions. How important is, is uh, tempo or time under tension when doing strength work? Because I've seen a lot of coach, uh, I've seen a lot of coaches, quote unquote, overusing it in my opinion. Yep. So if the question is how important is it? Um, it is important and you can get it through a bunch of different ways. So what this person means is um, time under tension. It's literally the amount of time, the seconds you have underneath a certain load. And some people will prescribe um, isolation movements or pause reps or eccentrics or tempos, a bunch of different ways to try to increase the time under that tension. But if you just do that, as this person alludes to, it's a great question. You can tip over too far and actually become unathletic because on the playing field, your body does not work that way. Your mm -hmm. body works with stretch reflex in everything that you do on the playing field. Everything is a stretch reflex. So the question then becomes, what are you trying to accomplish? If you are trying to become a better athlete on the field, I would not use a lot of pausing. And now if you have, if you're an athlete that has a massive strength deficiency relative to the cohorts in your sport, possibly if you need to gain more muscle mass, you need more time and attention, possibly, but you don't want to do that at the detriment of increasing someone's, um, 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 elasticity, like their, their, uh, um, speed, strength, bounce type stuff. Mm -hmm. So you can very easily overdo it, but the, the way, how you know you're overdoing it is dependent on what you're trying to accomplish. If you are a bodybuilder, you could do every single set with tempo and time or tensions because the fastest you have to move is paused on a, on a stage. Right. Right. If you're a basketball or a football player, I don't know I would do a whole lot of this at all. You know, you need to be able to um, sprint. Yep. Uh, and does that suffice to say that that's the same for uh, CrossFit athletes, for your for your games athletes? You don't no, do a lot? So no, CrossFit athletes are somewhere in between because mm -hmm. CrossFit athletes might need to add um, some muscle or they might need to add some strength in certain positions because one of our um, – we are not – on field athletes per se, I guess we are. Um, but like for a lift, let's say someone has a real sticking point at halfway up of their clean. Well, you spending some extra time in that position can build up a lot of strength in that position. So that might be a really beneficial for a person to actually bust through that pl plateau of whatever it is a, um, you know, a 335 clean or whatever it might be. Um, but um, so it, 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 you know, all of these answers are depends, okay. but that one yep. really depends. Got it. Okay. Last question we've got for this 
two-minute drill. How do I know how well I am? My primary care physician has confirmed that I'm not ill, but their concern seems to end at treatable diseases, of which I have none, and I have a clean lipid panel. I've been doing CrossFit for about 10 years with some detours into weightlifting and powerlifting, but it wasn't until the last couple of years couple of years that I got a handle on my mental health, which allowed me to finally put it all together. I'm down 55 pounds, and my physique could be best described as morning abs, which I think is <laughs> I'm 35 with uh, two young boys and want to live long enough to go to their retirement party, which is a goal. Awesome. I love that goal. Oh. Uh, modern, medicine is to- modern medicine has told me that I'm not in imminent danger, but what can I do? What can- metrics can I track? Which tests can, can I run to ensure that I'm poised for longevity? Okay. Um, our listeners are awesome. Like, damn, Great. lost 55 pounds, wants to be around for the kid's retirement, yep. uh, morning abs. <laughs> is, not, is not happy with just right, not, not being yeah, ill. <laughs> like I, the absence of disease is not enough for me to be satisfied that I'm, I'm doing what I should be doing. Um, here's my quick answer is um, go to a functional medicine practitioner, not a traditional mm-hmm. um, Western doctor. Um. They will do, they will run all the tests. So they'll find all the deficiencies that, you know, where your regular doctor might run a test to, you know, see if you have cancer or you're at risk for heart disease. These guys will do a whole bunch of the whole gamut. Um, and yes, like anything, there's massive discrepancies in between. Um, if like, just like if you were to get a personal trainer, an accountant or somebody to paint your house, there's really good ones. There's okay ones and there's bad ones. So I don't have a recommendation for how to find a really good one other than, um, I'll tease that CrossFit in the, is in the works of um, bringing this to the public. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am doing a beta pilot test with them right now. I've gotten my entire panel. Um, they did a DNA and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I've done a bunch of these things. I've gotten my, you know, my poop analyzed a bunch of times. I've spit and I've given blood. And yeah. um, This is the most impressed I've been. Uh, so I'm yeah. actually, it's through an organization called Wild Health. Yep. Um, and I'm impressed. I'm intrigued. Like it's, uh, it's not the normal stuff that, and I've been to functional medicine practitioners as well. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited about this. I think that this is going to, yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think this is going to be something pretty cool. Um, I think there's still things that they can work out and who knows like how expensive it's going to be and all the rest. But so far it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, from there. So that would be my first one is like, if you have the availability to do that, I would do that. Otherwise, what I would do is start tracking metrics in the gym. Mm -hmm. This is what's going to help you understand where you are truly at. Everything tracks together. So that in essence, and minus like some like silent disease that's growing inside of you, but even that one, like, so let's say um, you are able to work yourself down you lose another 10, 15 pounds. You get to not just morning abs, but you're at 9% body fat. You go from a 285. 9 a.m. abs. 9 p.m. abs. That's what we're right, aiming yeah. for. 9 That's p.m. abs. I love it. <laughs> um, and you go towards from a 285 deadlift to a 385 deadlift. And your mile time goes from 720 to 605. And you go from seven pull-ups to 27 pull-ups. And you get the you get the picture. As all those things are happening, what's also tracking is your cholesterol is falling into place. Your heart rate falls into place. Your blood pressure falls into place. Um your risk of diabetes goes down drastically. Your um, inflammation markers go way down. It's so this is the way that it's why we do measurable, observable, repeatable data in our workouts. How much did you lift? How far did it go? How long did it take to get there? How many reps did you do? So from that, you can track and you can figure out, am I getting better or not? Um, and again, depending on where you are in the life cycle, if you're 65, you might not need to get better. As long as you just stay where you are, that might be the win. Mm-hmm. But to me, that's what that's what I get excited about is without overstressing about it, because that's going to cause too much judgment and cause the other hormonal things in your body to do things that we don't want to do. Um, but just 
using that as a gauge as well as what you're getting from your doctor is a really powerful way to understand where you are on the, the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum. Uh, this is the last question, so I'm going to feel free to go on uh, to keep asking follow ups because I think it's really interesting. And maybe maybe there's an episode here, a full episode. But what what pops in my head when I see the question and just kind of listening to you is like, I don't. Do we have a sense of like what the metrics are for a 90 year old who's kicking ass? Like, do we know to be able to work backward and say, okay, that's what a 90 year old who, who's kicking ass looks like. That's whatever. That's their cholesterol. That's their X, you know X Y and Z. And so therefore we can work backwards and reverse engineer that. And that means if you're 30, here's where these numbers should be. Like, I, I, I don't even know if you know, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that, but that to me is like, that's an interesting question. Yeah. And, and, a, and a fun question is to, yep. as we start to get closer to that being a, a more of a reality, certainly there are outliers. We get to, we get to, or generations come and get to work backwards from there and say, this, this person could be 20 years old. Who knows? Cause, and, and be able to have a really good sense of, well, at 20 years old, here's what, here's the three things where we really want to track. Here's our best we can figure. Here's how we improve those things. Continue uh, as you were. <laughs> so there are some uh, more powerful metrics that they've associated with longevity. Um, fasting glucose or HA1C, it's a basically like your, um, um, your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the number one indicator. Another really strong one is vitamin D. Another really big one is testosterone. Um, but here's the, I'll ask you a different, I'll ask you this in a different way, Patrick. Let's envision picture of that 90 year old for me. That's kicking ass. Mm -hmm. Tell me about him or her. Mm -hmm. What do they tell me about? What, what do they do? What, what do they, they move a lot. Um, they have a social group. They probably cook all their own meals. Yeah. So, okay. So no, now it's like, back. those now are the three things that pop so into my you, head. You didn't say anything. You didn't say they have a blood pressure of this. They have a heart right. resting heart rate of this. Yeah. They have a fasting glucose of this and their cholesterol <laughs> right. is here. So yeah. why are, we're Behaviors. not going to work back. So we're not going to work yeah. backwards from that. What we're going to work backwards from is the things you said. So I agree with you. They can probably have, they probably have no limits. If they're kicking ass in their nineties, they have zero limitations from a movement or mobility perspective. Mobility. Yep. Mm. Yep. They can get up off the ground. They can jog. Like God forbid, they can jog, they can climb mountains, they can step up onto um, stone walls, they and can climb stairs. Uh, climb stairs, they can um, do sports and activities, they can um, get up off the ground, they can pick heavy things up, they can put things above their head. So what we're talking about is physical capacities. Yeah. So that's the first one. Then I love where you went with this. They probably also have a social group. Love that. I also think they're probably not sitting in, uh, you know, their armchair just bitching about politics. TV. Yep. Yeah, they're they're probably happy. If you're kicking ass in your 90s, you're happy. So let's work backwards from happy. Let's work backwards from social groups. Let's work back from movement proficiency. Let's work backwards from that's what we want to work backwards from, and that's why I started the conversation. We should be tracking gym stuff. Yeah, we should be tracking five factor stuff. That's what's going to lead us to where we want to be. Love that. Hi, my friend. That was our two minute drill. That was a good one. That was some great huh. questions. Those are great uh, questions. Yeah. Thank you everybody out there for sending them along. Again, you can find me on Instagram, PS Cummings. Drop me a DM. I will add it to our long list. We'll get to it as soon as we can. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. And Ben and I will be back next week for another episode of Chasing Excellence. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.